प्यार मांगा है तुम ही से नयनकार करो प्यार मांगा है तुम ही से नयनकार करो आ 
I hear the music stopping despite the intense desire to, for everyone to continue a little dance party. I think we are just in time. Um, so welcome to everyone who's just joined. Uh, this is session 14.1 uh, called Healthy Children Are Protected Children, uh, where we'll be taking stock of some of the collaboration between health and child protection sectors. Um, it's a session co-hosted by the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group, and I'm Susanna Davis. I'm one of two co-leads um, of the CPMS Working Group, seconded on behalf of Save the Children, and I'm, my other co-lead is in the room today, and she'll be helping us facilitate the session as well. And we're super pleased also to have speakers and facilitators from a wide variety of alliance 
members, but also um, health sector partners. So we've got colleagues from the Sphere Standards here today, colleagues from the World Health Organization representing the Ready Initiative. Um, and we're really pleased to have done this collaboratively with colleagues. And I think it's an interesting kind of opportunity to reflect on where we are in collaboration between health and child protection sectors and where we'd like to go. So if you're in the room, this is a very participatory session. Um, we'll spend most of the time in some discussion groups and we're so eager to hear about your experiences and your priorities when it comes to health and child protection collaboration. So if you're able to, if bandwidth allows, please do turn your camera on. When you're in the groups, um, when you go into the breakout groups, you can unmute your microphone, please do participate. Um, the main goal of this session is to hear from all of you and to exchange some ideas and identify um, possible priorities for ongoing alliance work. So um, hope you are ready to engage in that. Um, but with that, I'd also like us to get into the substance of the session. And I think I can see already um, there was an opening um, Zoom poll that we wanted to invite all of you to participate in, just asking a little bit about what um, how health and child protection actors are collaborating in your work, where you are right now in your current role, what's the collaboration like? Is it there? Is it, um, is it at different levels of the programming level? Or is there joint programming? Is there some child protection mainstreaming happening? Is there interagency collaboration? You've got a range of options in the poll that's just popped up. So please do go ahead and answer. Um, it's lovely to kind of see what people's experiences are like in the room. And we'll um, give you just a, a minute or two to respond. I can see a number of colleagues have already responded. We've got about 25% uh, responding so far. Um, and I'll just give you another moment to consider that um, question before we hand over. We're at about 40%, oh, 43. I'll give you one more moment, see if we can't just get at least up to 50%. There we are, up above 50%. So maybe we could share the results of, of that poll before I hand over. So I can see that kind of the biggest response um, is that there's some collaboration around advocacy for children's health and protection. Um, that coming in with about half of the responses. Lots of responses also for uh, collaboration happening at the interagency coordination group level um, and a similar kind of 30% response about joint and integrated programming, which is great. A uh, slightly smaller group uh, with, uh, with collaboration at the program level with child protection being mainstreamed into health. Um, and two smaller groups with um, about 17% 17 for in some other way and 13% for not at all. There's, there's no collaboration happening. Um, so really interesting. I think a range of experiences already in the room um, and we'll be really eager to kind of hear a little bit more about those when we go into our breakout rooms in um, just a few minutes. But before we do that, I'm so pleased uh, to welcome my colleague Anin Yanadik from the Sphere Standards, who will be kind of inspiring us with some opening remarks um, about health and child protection collaboration and some of the, the values and principles that we share between the two sectors. Thank you, Susanna. Can everybody hear me? All good? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. My name is Aninia. I have been with Spear for quite a number of years, and I also coordinate the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, uh, of which the Child Protection Minimum Standards are a member, uh, along with nine other standard initiatives altogether. And you would think standards are kind of, you know, standards. What's the, what's the inspiring aspect of standards since I need to be inspiring here? I think standards can be hugely inspiring. Standards on the one hand give a structure to uh, the current understanding of, of, of best practice in a sector. 
and yet they are flexible enough to um, to adapt, to contextualize the knowledge that we have built up in a specific sector, and in doing so, also reach out to other sectors because there is a certain common language and um, and, and they're hugely important also for coordination in that sense. And so the HSP is a place where all those standard handbooks come together and you will find them all on hspstandards.org. Um, and the first thing I did when I was asked to speak to you today was go to that platform and take a look at the child protection minimum standards. And of course, I already knew you guys are extremely advanced in your thinking when it comes to intersectoriality, when it comes to breaking down silos between different sectors. You have a whole section of the handbook that reaches out um, and links child protection activities to specific sectors. The HSP is very well placed to support you in that, um, not just uh, in single uh, uh, standards, but really across handbooks and showing that all those sectors actually have a common basis and a common um, raison d'être, and in that sense should be used working together. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to talk about that today. The reason, what, what gives actually this coherence to the uh, standards like child protection, like sphere, like um, there's, uh, uh, there's many others. Um, there's standards for uh, livestock, there's standards for economic recovery, for um, agriculture in, economic, uh, in, in, in emergencies. There's a whole plethora of standards. Also camp management, by the way, which can be interesting for you. And what they all have in common is a set of common values, uh, common principles, which are spelled out in the humanitarian charter, which you can find in the sphere handbook. The charter spells out the right to a life with dignity, the right to protection and security, and the right to humanitarian assistance. And it, it talks about uh, people's safety and security in a broader way than just those rights. It's a very forward-looking and inspirational document, actually. The second element that really links all those standards are the protection principles. Um, they talk about um, do no harm, access, uh, impartial access, um, help people recover from, from wrongdoing, and then also help people claim their rights. Those are the four protection principles. They are referred to also in your handbook, Child Protection Minimum Standards Handbook. And then we have the core humanitarian standard, which sets out nine commitments that help organizations structure their organization, but also their work in a way to ensure that they um, can work with people in a, again, in a dignified way. And in this structure, in this whole standards architecture, where do we find child protection? Well, I took a look at the Sphere Handbook, where child protection, but also children, have been a cross-cutting theme um, for at least this last uh, edition, if not the last two. And I found over 400 references to the word children and 50 references to the word term child protection. Some of that is references, actually, but there are actually quite a few places where child protection is directly referenced in sphere. And I took a look at all those references and what comes out is that the, the way child protection has been cross-referenced across sphere is mostly in terms of um, safe referral pathways, which means having to identify children that need protection in the first place. Um, and those referral pathways are mostly uh, spelled out in the nutrition chapters because there has been, there is a whole section on severe acute malnutrition, which is focusing very much on children. 
There's a whole section on infant and young child feeding standards, which also have make sure that they include the need to identify children in need of protection and making sure they can be referred to uh, an agency that can properly um, that can receive them and cater to their needs. In shelter, just as a side note, in the shelter chapter, there's a reference to child protection in the context of child labor, where people are actually asked to help in reconstruction that should not include children. And then um, in the health chapter, we have health service delivery, triage, and again, referral. In the communicable diseases, again, coordinate the, the really important element of coordinating with child protection actors and referral, and the same for uh, newborn and childhood illnesses and, um, sorry, and communicable diseases preparedness and outbreak and also for the standard on injury and trauma care. So across, almost I would, across the health chapter where, where, where uh, um, aid actors work with children or are probably will work with children, there's um, a link to child protection. And that is, um, I also found that in, in your handbook, you have a section on disease outbreak, and there also you, you refer to the importance of understanding the, the context, the cultural context of the outbreak so that the response can really also cater to people's needs. I remember Susanna telling me about the whole safe space idea that um, child-friendly spaces that, um, that child protection actors had before the Ebola outbreak, and that suddenly had to be completely turned around because the whole idea of bringing children together in a, in a space was actually no longer possible. So the focus on culture and on context is actually something I wanted to stop at for just a minute, because all our standards are called quality and accountability standards. And we we think well accountability is to be accountable to in this case uh, affected people and to make sure that uh, people um, can th that we take their needs into account but we're also talking about quality and quality is not just a technical quality aspect of how much we need to deliver by when and everything in terms of child protection Quality is really this understanding of context of specific vulnerabilities and um, focus on cultural differences and specificities. And where I want to get at is that in sphere, you will find that sensitivity for, for context as well. And I suggest that um, for those of you also who don't quite see that there is a collaboration between sectors, do take a look at the Sphere handbook. Um, I invite you to just get a bit familiar with, with the Sphere standards, and you will see that there's a lot of reference to, um, to, to communities, to understanding people's needs directly. And when you see gaps in the way these standards can actually or should ought to work together, then you are probably onto something. So if you if you feel well, it's all good and fine, but actually, it's still really difficult. Even understanding that the standards are meant to work together, it's still difficult to to do that. Then I would like to invite you to write to Susanna or myself and let's talk because there's always a way to improve the um, the way these standards work together. But I think the basis is there, and a lot is on us also to start using the standards in the way they were um, meant to be used, which is really in conjunction across sectors, across silos, um, to really help, to really um, conceive of and, and develop a, a approach, uh, a response that directly helps the people that were, were um, supporting. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Nina, for that introduction. And I think it comes out really clearly in your remarks, the sort of common values, the common principles and commitment to children's well-being that's shared between both sectors, the commitment to quality and accountability to affected uh, populations, the link between the core humanitarian standard, the protection principles, all of these things are our joint commitments that that health and child protection actors have um, and, you know, definitely join you in, in inviting colleagues who maybe haven't um, linked through the SPEAR standards in the past to, to do so and explore some of those commonalities, which can maybe help us um, bridge gaps where, where we haven't had such strong collaborations in the past. So a huge thank you to Anemia. Um, so as promised, our next activity in the session is to dive into some breakout groups. Um, so in just a moment, the producers will share and already are sharing uh, the slide with some instructions. So we, um, we will have actually about 20 minutes um, and you can choose what topic you would like to. So if you have a little look in, um, in the meeting chat already, you'll see that there are five options for the topics you can discuss. If you'd like to discuss humanitarian coordination, you can stay in the plenary room, so stay just where you are, um, and you'll be joining a session facilitated uh, by my colleague Lauren, Lauren Biankowski from the Child Protection Area of Responsibility. If you would like to explore acute onset conflicts, um, you can join room one that will be facilitated um, by my co-lead from the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group, Joanna Wedge. Um, if you want to explore how health and child protection colleagues um, collaborate in infectious disease settings. We have Rachel Cummings representing the Ready Initiative, who's ready to discuss those with you. And that will be in room two. In room three, primary healthcare and child protection that'll be facilitated uh, by Stephanie Burroughs from the World Health Organization. And in room four, engaging communities together um, that'll be facilitated by my colleague, Mizumi Yamashima, um, who's from the CPMS working group. So in just a minute, all of those rooms will be open. Um, you'll have your facilitator to lead you through three questions where for each topic, we're sort of taking stock of what are health and child protection doing together on this topic already? What are the needs and gaps? Um, identifying then together, what are some entry points and opportunities? Who should we be working with? And um, suggesting particularly uh, for the Alliance, what are some urgent priorities? What are things you would like to see um, us work on? So if I can ask the producers to yes, go ahead and Susanna. open all the rooms. <laughs> Sorry, Susanna, I, I had them all ready and then someone clicked open that shouldn't have clicked open and now I need to redo them. So just give me like two seconds. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Just nobody, none of the co-hosts, please just don't touch anything. Please just let me, uh, I'm just going to rename them again and then I will open them. Just bear with me. Two seconds. That's okay. Thanks very much, Julie. So um, <laughs> they will come up in just a minute and you'll have a facilitator in each group. You'll have about 20 minutes to discuss. Um, so we'll send you off and for colleagues following along on the live stream, just stay right where you are in this main, we will stay in this main session and start the discussion on collaboration in humanitarian coordination in just a moment. Um, and with that, I will stop talking and hand over to uh, Lauren, who's going to facilitate the discussion in this room. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's really wonderful to see um, some faces and feel free to take your uh, microphone off of mute uh, to put your camera on. I'm not normally a camera person, so you're in safe company if you do want to leave it off, um, but we do welcome. It's a safe space. Um, and also, if it's okay with everyone, we will record this um, breakout group. Um, but it's just for note taking purposes. So do let us know if you have any concerns with um, it being recorded. Um, okay. So I think there are some people in the chat who are still trying to figure out how to 
join a breakout group. So I don't know if you want to come in again and explain. No, it's okay. The producers are there. They're responding to individual people. Okay. So the the just um, if you're struggling to join a room, the producers will help you. Just put the message in the chat, and they're responding individually. Lauren, you can go ahead, and I'm here to support you if you need anything. Wonderful. Um, so in terms of coordination, we're really focusing on um, how a child protection coordination group, whether you are in a refugee setting, an internally displaced setting, um, whatever type of, of setting, um, a disaster, um, and when there's a child protection coordination group or a health um, coordination group. So it might be called a cluster, a sector, um, an AOR for child protection, um, but really looking at these interagency bodies that are um, coordinating child protection and coordinating the health response. And we want to talk about today how these two interagency bodies um, can come together and or how they are already coming together um, and working for children's health, safety, well-being. Um, and so that's gonna be a lot of our discussion. We will have, um, Susanna has shared in the chat, a Jamboard link. Um, so if everyone could open that uh, Jamboard, we would welcome your contributions. Um, so about a few different conversations or a few different questions. So the first one is around stock taking. Um, and what we wanna look at here is um, are, what is happening now in terms of the health coordination group and a child protection coordination group, how are they already collaborating? Um, and then what are some critical needs and gaps? So I want to open up that conversation. Um, feel free to type in the chat. I'll try to, um, Susanna and I will try to keep track of that. Um, but what do you think is happening? What's going well? Um, and what are still outstanding needs and gaps in terms of our, um, in terms of our collaboration with the health sector and between child protection and health? So I'm going to open the floor um, and also feel free to type in your responses on the Jamboard itself and we'll keep track of that. Feel free just to speak up, go off of mute, um, share um, what you think is happening, what's going well, what's not, um, what could be improved. So I will open it up here. And let us know if you have any problems accessing the Jamboard. So really looking at where we are. Okay, I'm seeing some movement already happening on the Jamboard. And share it just if it's helpful for colleagues to see. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. No worries. Okay, so that's what, so we've got our, our first comment. Um, coordination between actors is a real challenge. Um, pilot safe identification referral will be important for unaccompanied at health facilities. Um, I just want to go back to the coordination between actors is a real challenge. And I don't know if the poster, whoever mentioned that, or if someone else wants to come in and talk about that. What are some of the challenges? I also see a, a message from Pierre in the chat um, saying that uh, he could share his experience if you'd like. You're very welcome to. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you, Pierre. Pierre, you're on mute, I think. Feel free to come off of mute and share your experience. Can I try? Go ahead, Hassan. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, in fact, coordination between actors is a challenge, is uh, really something we are experiencing here in Burkina Faso. Not because uh, the actors, meaning those from health and those from child protection, uh, the domain where I work, not meaning that they are not uh, um, skilled, but the problem is that uh, uh, many of the time they are overwhelmed. And uh, when they are overwhelmed, you know, for instance, in uh, 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 structures like uh, uh, CFA, the child protection, uh, uh, I mean, uh, child friendly spaces. Uh, you have many, too many children. And when some are sick, some are wounded, uh, it's not easy to, to have, you know, health workers taking care of them at any time. But sometimes it's taken time too much time and the cases sometimes are worse and uh, uh, this is really uh, cause really damage to, to those children and uh, that's why I am also experiencing this or let's say we are also experiencing these challenges in terms of uh, uh, taking care of children as far as the health is concerned. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hassan. So the time um, it's and the overwhelming number of children um, and it's not that people aren't unskilled. Um, they are very skilled, but um, it takes time to collaborate. Thank you so much, Hassan. Yes, you're welcome. Um, okay. I'm seeing, um, so there was a need that was expressed, um, safe identification referral. Um, there's another comment. Uh, whenever there is an emergency, uh, most of the agencies show up in the place for interest um, for getting funding. So there's always that, that push. What's the most attractive place to work um, and to get funding? And sometimes that it kind of goes to Hassan's point around timing, um, around time, but to put all of, of so much effort and energy into collaborating um, is, is a challenge. What do you think are some of the needs? Um, we know that there's critical gaps related to numbers of children, um, but what are some of the the critical gaps or needs that you think um, are important or need to be recognized for collaboration between the health sector and the child protection sector? If you can think about from a child's perspective, um, from a interagency perspective, Uh, can I say something again? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, from our side, um, we we have uh, uh, okay. We have you know the um, the structures like uh, uh, clusters or working groups that help in coordinations uh, in the field. But sometime or many of the times, you know, the actors don't really um, talk to one another. Even when, you know, there is a certain kind of coordination that is set because they are overwhelmed. It means that uh, they don't really have time to coordinate, uh, to take care properly. Uh, 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 of the, the, the children because you, we are in emergency situation and you have too many children that are really out of school, that are wandering. And when, when we gather them in uh, the, the, the child uh, friendly spaces, it's not always easy you know, to take care of them. So the fact that 
you know, they, they are overwhelmed, I mean, that is really diff difficult for them. So the, the gap is uh, to have, you know, or the need is to have more actors, whether health side or child protection actors sites to coordinate and to properly take care of those children. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So I heard a couple of things is one, more actors, so more people um, to respond, but then also more dedicated resources to for coordination that their role is specifically to make sure that those conversations happen, happen um, to make sure that those uh, that there is um, uh, that collaboration, that focused collaboration um, happening. So dedicated coordination and then more actors. Great. Um, thank you for that. Anyone else? Let's see. Uh, Andrea says, um, maybe we can, uh, I think, um, Hassan, I think the health cluster um, would be curious to understand more about the gaps in delivering health care for children at CFSs. So perhaps there's a bridge um, and using the CFSs as an entry point for supporting children with health care. Um, and so that might be another conversation. I know we've got limited time here, but that could be another conversation that we follow up on um, with the health cluster, specifically in Burkina Faso, and maybe um, that example could then extend to other countries. Um, so Andrea, okay, we thanks. Certainly, um, I think Susanna and others, we can certainly follow up um, to put you in touch directly. Um, Susanna, I'm seeing, are there any others? Getting the actual number of children, especially UAC, is a problem. So understanding the extent of the need, um, needs of children. And again, I think that's where some dedicated coordination can help. Um, uh, I know a lot of countries st struggle with resourcing coordination. Um, and so to understand really what is the extent of the problem, what are the needs, um, I think that's where that can help. Um, Susanna, do we have until 7.15 or 7.20? What is our... I think we're, we're planned to go until seven, uh, until um, 15 past the hour. Yeah, you've got okay, four so and a half should... minutes remaining. Okay. Okay. So um, I think... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just to say there was one comment um, in the chat from uh, uh, from Pamela, a colleague from IRC uh, in DR Congo, um, saying that they often have integrated programming um, where it's possible, particularly with health, CP and GBV, and that kind of promotes um, collaboration and that um, in an emergency, if they don't have health um, kind of services being delivered by their agency, then they're trying to, to collaborate and coordinate with other actors. That's great. That's great. Thanks so much, Pamela. I think those integrated programs really help um, within an agency. Um, I, I'm wondering now, um, maybe we can look at a little bit at some entry points and opportunities and priorities. So um, entry points and opportunities, we've seen some joint programming, and maybe that can bubble over to, um, to coordination groups. Um, I, we've heard from Hassan in Burkina Faso, some human resources, some staffing. Um, we've looked at CFSs as a potential entry point. Are there other are there other interagency uh, mechanisms that you think it's an opportunity for us to collaborate better? And feel free to type in the chat, put it on Jamboard, come off of mute. Anyone else that it could, the entry point could be people, it could be a place, it could be an action. 
Um, Pierre has said, we've advocated for children with disabilities in the health sector um, and have been granted some amount to build a latrine at our school. Um, so Pierre, I don't know if you are able to tell us a little bit more about some of your work in Malawi, um, but we're seeing some connections between other sectors um, wash. Um, which is great. So intercluster um, forums, do you, do we think that um, attending each other's meetings, potentially, um, perhaps joint assessments? I don't know if anyone has seen that that could be helpful. Yes, that was me. This is John from South Sudan. Great. Yeah, in South Sudan, the coordination effort work, we work through uh, a coordination system has been built in a manner that we have interagency system, we have interclass system, and that help in many ways. And the gap that we have is on mandatory lines well, that is the conventional gap where we have the health are health and child protection are child protections. So in a situation where we are discussing a, a critical uh, point of views on protection could not be the critical point of view on health. So the prioritization also become a gap. So when, when we go for emergency response, uh, the health and food say this is life saving, child protection is not life saving. So these are the gaps that the system needs to address. Thank you. Okay, trying to get on the same page. Samuel, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. So I, I want just to come in here yeah, for this uh, question. Okay, my name is Samuel, I'm Congolese by nationality, but currently living in Kenya as a refugee and uh, working with uh, refugee children in child protection. And uh, okay, with uh, lived experience, I've uh, realized that um, uh, to build a uh, strong uh, institution, there is a need for collaboration. Because when we talk about child protection, we look at, uh, it's very viral, but uh, each component can be uh, fulfilled by any organization. So that at the, end of, uh, at the end of it, all of us, when we bring our impact together, we realize that uh, we have achieved the protection of our children uh, in a very meaningful way. And uh, me being a refugee, we are looking at, um, uh, I do advocate for localization of uh, humanitarian action. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, only the uh, humanitarian action must be effective if the person of concern is put in the front line to fight against the problems that they're facing. And uh, uh, in this regard, I look at um, uh, the problems that uh, re uh, African children are facing in general is totally different to the problems that refugee children are facing in Africa. And apart from that, it's totally different with the refugee children are facing in Asia, in Europe, in America, and so on. So there is a context that requires us to work closer with uh, civil societies, community-based organizations, refugee-led organizations, foundations, uh, uh, the board of government, so that all of us, because we all of us represent a, a common, uh, a given community, so, so that all of us, once we meet, as a stakeholders and not as beneficiaries, we can be able to uh, we can be able to present our uh, impact and outcome. And uh, the only challenge I've realized in this is that uh, sometimes, as a, a local pioneers, like, like local um, actors, we are not given that chance. We are not given that value as uh, as stakeholders. Instead, we are given uh, value as uh, just beneficiaries. But I still believe, I'm, I still believe and very confident that uh, once we fully engage the local actors as part of the uh, stakeholders, 
uh, we are able to address the protection matters. We are able to reduce the refugee and forced migration aspect. We are going, we are able to reduce the uh, uh, to reduce the risk uh, the children at risk and be able to take many children back to school in a safe and uh, uh, conducive environment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Samuel. To everyone who's who's joining us now, we were in the the coordination group, and it was just, uh, and it was a great way to to wrap up with hearing about uh, local groups and their role in uh, coordinating. So thank you. Thanks very much, Lauren, and thanks everybody for, for coming back to the main room. I know that um, the discussion groups are always too short, no matter how much time we allocate to them. Um, I hope your, um, your groups were as dynamic as ours. Um, we have a few minutes before we'll wrap up this, um, this session as a whole. Um, we would love to invite um, the colleagues who were um, facilitating the breakout groups to share just really briefly, because we're a little over time, maybe in two minutes, if you could share um, one critical need um, that was raised in your discussions and one urgent priority for the alliance or one uh, one kind of action that needs to be taken that um, that came up in your discussion. So maybe if I go through the groups, um, could I perhaps um, invite uh, Joanna to um, to share first? Absolutely, though, I was still tinkering with it and trying to <laughs> update the, slide, the Jamboard slide, but Absolutely. Um, we had an interesting conversation. We are only really just getting started, as, as you can imagine. Um, we were looking at programmatic collaboration in acute and rapid onset conflicts and disasters and looking at what or collaboration is already happening. And there was um, some example uh, given yesterday um, by one of our colleagues in, in Pakistan, um, looking at how collating, co-locating um, a child-friendly space with a primary health care clinic was a way to um, make sure that cases went back and forth. Um, any issues that arose could be kind of transferred um, to health staff or to child protection staff. Um, there was um, conversation about making sure that child protection staff had uh, basic public health training so that they could be uh, passing those messages, uh, whether it was through um, their casework, whether it was through child friendly spaces, whether it was through community outreach and, and so on. Um, so those were um, some of the examples. There was um, talk, oh, I was only supposed to give one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just, I don't know. I'm just doing my two minutes as fast as I can. Um, two things that kind of came out that, you know, are interesting for us to be thinking about as we move forward. Um, two of them, many things. But one, one of them was um, revisiting or returning to the dialogue around adverse childhood effects or experiences, sorry, uh, the ACE framework. This is mm -hmm. something that many primary health care workers uh, use and understand, and it's something that resonates well with us as child protection sector, but we don't use it that much. So maybe to um, consider how, um, you know, child protection fits within that in a humanitarian setting, have a better understanding of what ACE looks like in conflict setting, in a chronic emergency, in a rapid onset emergency. So exploring a bit more um, the relevance of that framework for um, for a humanitarian uh, child protection. Um, and then the other one, which I don't know if it was getting, yeah, that was the pink one that was coming, heading towards was um, influencing um, and integrating child protection into the main health um, trainings or guidance so that we can, within child protection, we know that health workers are getting a basic understanding of where um, child protection as a sector is coming from in a humanitarian um, conflict or disaster setting. Thanks so much, Joanna. And I think that's a lot of like interesting ideas for us to act on, particularly when it comes to joint training or kind of complementarity in the, in the training of the two sectors to be sure it's speaking to each other. Um, so I'll move swiftly on and maybe I could um, invite um, Rachel Cummings, who was leading the, the group on infectious disease settings, to, to share a couple of points if you can. 
thank you, thank you so much. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to join. Um, we were uh, a quality group, not necessarily a quantity group, but um, we'll present back there. It was a really great conversation actually, and I'd, I'd like us to find ways to, to continue the collaboration. It's been a really interesting learning for me as well. So um, we talked specifically about working together between child protection and health in infectious disease outbreaks. And you know, I won't go into the details, but obviously infectious disease outbreaks uh, increase risk specifically for children. And I think you know, one of the learnings that we've had from previous outbreaks and also in COVID is that health workers often think specifically around quite focused on clinical care and case management of, of clinical um, patients and we don't consider that child protection lens of looking at a child holistically so that was that's a big learning and I think one of the things and we said there one of the positive outcomes of COVID um, was that we were forced to consider uh, children differently, I think, because it, you know, the effect and Im impacts of, of children, primary and secondary impacts was, was great. So some of the things that came out of that collaboration during COVID were these really great, if people don't know them, I'll give them a plug, the mini guides, the Child Protection Alliance developed. I was looking at them to, to prepare for this and um, I just loved them. They're really accessible. They're really practical. So yeah, plug for those. And I think, you know, what can we be doing more? What are the critical needs? I think we talked about how do we institutionalize that thinking in sort of health actors who don't necessarily work or are exposed to child protection sector? Um, how does that become institutionalized? So one of the ways we thought about that was developing more case studies and more examples. So you sort of demystify child protection for health and then you demystify health for child protection because we talk similar but not the same language so all of these mm. things we need to translate for each other and we do that by working collaboratively just one point because I know we're short on time but I was talking with Elspeth about how the complexity of the humanitarian health sector and it's large and it's complex and then infectious disease outbreak architecture is large and complex and they don't necessarily talk to each other so we find it complex within the humanitarian health world and the outbreak teams also find it you know difficult so how do we marry that up and one way we i thought of doing this was to we have pillars in outbreak coordination so we have coordination we have uh, risk communication community engagement we have uh, case management for infectious disease. we have different pillars and I wondered if there's a way that we could bring out those case studies or good examples for each pillar to understand how child protection uh, how we can integrate child protection integrate the thinking of child protection into those pillars uh, that's just a, a sort of a practical example I think of how we can develop further this this collaborative space but there's an appetite for it and a willingness for sure Thanks so much, Rachel. And I think a great plug for um, for the ready mini guides, which I know just got launched. So happy to happy to support them and some really great ideas for how how we can take it forward. And I know we're equally super eager to continue the conversation. Um, I will jump swiftly on um, and see if I can invite uh, Stephanie to present um, in just a couple of minutes, if you can, um, the discussions from your group on primary health care and child protection, which I think was one of the biggest groups. Yeah, we had a very uh, good conversation that um, was all too brief. And I think I will be very quick because it covers what we discussed was very much covered a lot by the other groups. Essentially, it was about trying to build synergies between the different stakeholders and the differences between uh, child protection and and health and the lack of sometimes understanding between the two groups and the need to speak the same language and um, to work more closely together. Um, and then a priority that came up very much was about capacity building um, for, for various groups and that it, um, yeah, that we need to spend a lot more time on on training uh, all the different uh, parties uh, that work on this in this area, um, partly to under better understand each other, but then also uh, to recognise um, uh, child maltreatment, for example. Um, and then briefly, it's always a, a challenge, but uh, sustained funding came up as a another priority, but that's always more challenging. So I'll stop there because of the time. 
Thanks very much, Stephanie. You know, I think really great ideas. It's lovely to hear that across multiple groups, there was um, a call for kind of joint or complementarity in training. Um, and I appreciate the, the note on the importance of funding, because certainly I think sometimes when we're trying to push for increased coordination or collaboration amongst sectors, we're expecting people just to do it um, in their spare time, which no humanitarians have. Um, so it's it's a fair push for us to also recognize that um, the um, some of the activities to join up the two sectors will require funding. And that's something that we need to explore hopefully together on how we could mobilize that. Um, and then um, if I can move on to the group on communities uh, that Mosini led, which I think was also quite a big group. No, uh, thanks. No, it was actually a smaller group, oh. but the um, we had a good but introduction. Yeah, exactly. Quality uh, discussions. So, oh yeah, the same thing came from the other group, uh, but also there was a very much a big um, emphasis of the um, health sector, especially at the community level, is the entry point or the first port of call for children who need support, who is experiencing violences, and that's why it's extremely important to work with health sectors to be refer to be um, to refer them to the child protection or other services needed so or there there's also some examples already working with the health committees or having steering committee at community level that is consist of the different uh, sectors. Um, and there was also interesting discussion of community health worker. Yes, some of them working. And there was also a discussion that community health worker is already overwhelming with so many tasks that mm. they have to do. So we have to be very conscious about their times and the, how to engage with community health workers. And priorities, yes, not surprise, training. Uh, with health actors, uh, especially again for uh, for the child safeguardings and how to see children more like uh, on child protection lens, so that they can see children not just as a patient, but also maybe children who need support, different support, so they can refer and so on. So there is also a, a point of the collaboration on uh, child protection referrals between um, health and child protection. There's also a lot of how to uh, engage like practical tools for how to engage, how to speak, also how to jointly manage funding between the health and the child protections are coming. And one point also to note mm -hmm. that the, uh, they are talking, the um, participants already talking with the health actors regularly, but this kind of tools can help to for them to discuss more concrete issues what can be done between child protection and health. Over to you. Thanks very much, Mazumi. It's great to see similar themes uh, coming up and, and also kind of, I think that flag about the importance of connecting at the community level where health is often an entry point. Um, last but certainly not least, um, Lauren, if you can go, and we only have about one minute, so if you wouldn't mind keeping it as brief as you can manage. I know it was a dynamic discussion as well. Yeah, um, no, there, a lot of the same things. Um, I think an entry point is is we're working on referrals together um, between health mm -hmm. and child protection, um, CFSs or any sort of um, safe space for children could be an entry point. Um, a lot, a lot was said around needing more dedicated resources because people are so overwhelmed. So dedicated, coordinated. Um, coordination teams um, and more actors, um, and which leads to more funding, um, joint analysis, and then finally the, the point around localization. I think really getting behind local mm -hmm. actors who can have a different um, perception, different view of the needs and might be able to work more holistically um, could be really helpful. Thanks, Lauren. And I think that's the, this is, uh, well, at least in the presentation, this is the only group that's that's brought up that topic about localization and how we might jointly engage um, national actors uh, together, as well as the communities that other groups spoke about. Um, really great points from all of the groups. And thank you so much for, for everyone's participation and dedication. We are about at time. If the producer will indulge me, thank you very much. Just to share the last slide on next steps. 
just to say thank you very much. We have recorded all the group discussions and done our best to take very detailed notes as well as the notes that are on the Jamboard. We will be producing kind of a very light um, session report so that we can distill some of the great discussions you've had and capture them. Um, and we will share it through the Alliance website. Um, this is Health and Child Protection Collaboration is an ongoing priority for the CPMS Working Group, but I know for the Alliance as well. Um, so we are looking at exploring a forum to support this and how we can continue to prioritize kind of joint actions or tools that are needed. Um, so we will kind of continue to be in touch. If you're particularly interested in this area and you would like to be in touch with the CPMS working group about how to engage, our email address is on the screen. Please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, we would be so happy to be in touch. Um, and we'll look forward to continue exploring how um, we can prioritize this. It's so clear from this session that there's this mutual interest between health and child protection actors on collaborating together, on working um, and, and coordinating together better. Um, and it sounds like we've got some great priorities to explore. So just a huge thank you for all of your participation and a really big thank you um, to my colleagues who helped to facilitate the discussion, to Anina from SPEAR for the opening remarks, um, and to the CPAOR, the World Health Organization, the Ready Initiative, um, and please don't let me forget somebody. Um, just a big thank you to, to everybody who's, uh, who's participated um, and been in the, the session with us. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.